This is the Lou Rockwell Show. One of the great things about doing this show is I get to meet some of my heroes. And boy, that is certainly the case today. We're honored to have John Taylor Gatto on. John, first of all, he's like a poet. I mean, I've never seen anybody write about American education with the brilliance and concision and the words that touch your brain and touch your heart like he does. So I want to very highly recommend, first of all, I'm going to mention, even though it's not his latest book, my favorite book of his, which is The Underground History of American Education. He's also author of Dumbing Us Down, his most recent wonderful book, which shows his scholarship as well as his writing ability, uh, is called Weapons of Mass Instruction. Now, John, first time that I, uh, I was lucky enough to have you come to my attention was in 1991 when you wrote the greatest article ever to appear in the Wall Street Journal. It was, <laughs> it was the year that you were named Teacher of the Year in New York State, and you said, I'm not going to earn a living hurting children anymore. And that's when you started on this great journey, at least in the public sense. So why did you feel you were hurting children when you were heralded as the greatest public school teacher in the state of New York? Well, I was in the business, Lou, for 30 years. And obviously, I had been a subject of the business for a long, long time, as most of us are. So as time passed, I became aware of several things that didn't seem to add up. Uh, I became incrementally conscious of how many different ways to learn there are, and yet I was in a structure that didn't allow variability. If it did allow it, it was on a kind of random whimsical basis that never lasted very long, there was no attempt to adapt to particular uh, people and their and their own learning code. So that plus the lockstep bells ringing as though you would in a a rat training experiment, and uh, a whole variety of other things began to weigh on my conscience. Uh, I, I certainly don't want to claim uh, the, that I was, uh, uh, you know, lost in the anti-morality of the thing, but it came to be an almost daily nagging, and I tried every possible negotiation with the structure above me uh, to bend the bars, and you know, I had a certain amount of success doing that, but as I became more confident that genius is as common as the air we breathe and that the mechanism that I was unwittingly imposing on on the kids was almost designed to prevent their genius from emerging, uh, you know, I became... Very dissatisfied. And then finally, I, my wife got elected to the school board in the Upper West Side of Manhattan, a school district that was spending about $45 million a year uh, and always claiming to not have enough money <laughs> there. And thanks to her own curiosity going through the files the school district and bringing those files home to me on the uh, the promise they'd be back uh, the next morning before the superintendent got in, I came to see that institutional schooling is an enormous business. It's the largest business in the United States by far, not only for its direct expenditures, because so many other businesses depend upon the work of schooling so that they can succeed. Now, that triggered an immense curiosity that I'll tell you, frankly, Lou, 30 years later, is still active. I began to spend all my free time uh, in the library stacks and talking to people who were willing to be candid with me 
and I saw the, where the business had come from, why it took the shape it took, how it managed from its inception, which really is not very long ago. You could probably say that the period around World War One, or if you were, uh, if you wanted to push it, the 1890s uh, was the start of the schooling that you and I and everybody listening is familiar with. So by pushing into this arcane and extremely poorly written uh, literature, I came to see slowly and reluctantly that what we're experiencing now and have experienced uh, uh, for at least the last 50 years uh, is quite deliberate. It's an intellectual decision. I'm not suggesting that any teacher or principal or superintendent is aware of this because if they were aware and opened their mouth, they wouldn't be long for uh, their employment. That happens regularly, too. Uh, and I managed to see that if you could document in their own words what the founders of schooling actually said when they didn't think anyone was listening, that it, there was no necessity for a conspiracy theory. They would indict themselves by their own language. Could I give you one example, and then I'll stop this this nonstop uh, uh, monologue. Don't uh, stop. It's wonderful. William James, uh, who really is the inventor of psychology as an academic subject at Harvard, the famous, uh, certainly the best-known uh, pragmatist, uh, w was a, a large part of the founding core. And w what James says in his most famous book, Psychology, is that schools must teach habit training and not intellectual development. Let me give you his actual words. Habit, this is William James speaking, not John Gatto. Habit is the enormous flywheel of society. It's the most precious agent. It alone is what saves the children of fortune from the envious uprisings of the poor. It alone prevents the most repulsive jobs from being deserted. It holds the miner in his darkness. It keeps different social strata from mixing. Now, you could put those same words in the mouth of an ideologue of the left and say this is a denunciation. But, in fact, James was one of the architects. He was, in fact, justifying what early schooling was doing in setting up a structure. You know, John, one of the great things about your books, and I must say it makes you unfortunately so unusual today you mentioned going to the stacks you go to the original sources you've obviously read everything and you find all these great nuggets i certainly agree with you that the great evil of the current public school system sort of began flowering during the progressive era but didn't the awful horace man from my home state of massachusetts didn't, oh didn't he actually advocate a public school system that would train children to be obedient citizens good little soldiers oh, absolutely uh, the difficulty, and there's no difficulty in indicting Horace Mann. Uh, he does it with almost every utterance out of his mouth. But Mann himself was a flunky. He was the front man for the Peabody, Coal Interest, and a number of other important uh, uh, prophets of the future. So Mann was recruited because he was young, a good public speaker, and politically very, very ambitious. And at the same time, he did not come from a suitable family background in Massachusetts to, to rise politically. So he was approached by uh, uh, William Ellery Channing, uh, the Unitarian Pope, mm. 
yeah, in horrible. whose congregation man sat. And a deal was struck. Man would spend his efforts doing something he had no interest whatsoever in doing, which was selling compulsion schooling to the citizens of Massachusetts. And in exchange, he was promised Daniel Webster's seat in Congress, which, in fact, he got after he had achieved his assigned mission. Uh, Daniel Webster, uh, there can't be too many Americans with uh, with a bigger name than Webster, denounced man page after page in the congressional record. Nobody bothers to dredge that up, although it's fairly simple to do. And he indicted man, man's character, his morality, everything about him. And furthermore, this should tickle your funny bone, Lou. After man had done his job, his backers wanted to get him out of the way because man was trying to take credit for this when, as I say, he was only the flunky. So they exiled man to the presidency of a new little liberal arts college in Ohio, Antioch, which had been a utopian colony, recently converted. So it was the middle of nowhere, the sticks. I mean, without email and modern communication, man was essentially declared a non-citizen. And furthermore, in his own writing and in the writing of his wife, who published a, a biography of him, he denounces these people as, you know, rats, which, of course, they were. Well, that is fascinating. So, as usual, anytime you have any encounter with John Taylor Gatto, you learn something. And, John, we know what horrible institutions these public schools are. I think the private schools are, by and large, connected to the public schools, except for maybe a few examples. And for, for there are a few exceptions. And it's fairly easy and quite instructive, Lou, to notice the exceptions and then sitting with their catalogs and a few of their graduates to distill what the elite private boarding schools offer and expect from their charges. That was the secret. Uh, you know, I won a lot of awards as a teacher, and I don't want to take credit for I'll take credit for a lot of hard work, but the idea is I took directly from what the 20 leading elite private boarding schools were expecting from their kids and delivering for their kids. And the great irony is that really, although they're quite expensive to attend, nothing they do costs a penny. I mean, they then it's fine. They uh, compensate their workers and they maintain uh, beautiful grounds, etc. But what they actually do is is like a mandate to be free inside yourself, and then free to make the widest possible uh, approach to opportunity in your life. So I simply incorporated. I spent about three years studying uh, the, the the Choates and the Andovers and the St. Paul's and the Grottons of the country. There aren't really very many. There are no more than 20 of these places. There's perhaps another 300 that take their marching orders from the Inner Circle 20. Uh, and and I found that with Harlem kids, these principles were easily transferable, that after about 90 days, the discipline problems that are associated with, uh, you know, kids from straightened backgrounds really virtually vanished. And people would come to me and ask me how I was doing this. They assumed what is totally incorrect, that I have a sweet personality, <laughs> and I love kids. 
Uh, I mean, I love people, that's true. Uh, I really am uneasy around incomplete people, and we assign a state of almost permanent incompletion to our young, which means, of course, that when they become legal adults, they'll remain incomplete for the rest of their lives. But here, the secret had been lurking in our neighborhood really forever because our elite private boarding schools follow the same kind of, I can't know if I can call it a formula, that the training of the managerial classes has followed throughout Western history, at least, and have not spent much time on the East. So that th these are ancient principles known to work, and they don't cost anything. Now, that's about as radical a statement as I'm capable of making, that unfortunately, in the 20th century, we evolved a kind of an economy that could not tolerate people who thought for themselves, people who were self-sufficient, uh, and a whole lot of other good adjectives. Uh, we had, right up through the 1870s, a thoroughly entrepreneurial economy, where you really could go from the bottom to the top very, very quickly if you... If you worked hard and your imagination was active and you studied the world around you, I mean, we were the wonder of the world. Nobody ever wanted to emigrate to anywhere else but the United States because suddenly the boot of the manager was taken off the back of the neck of everybody. And the best evidence of that, because I really do want to stay away from ideology here, is our patent rate. By the beginning of the 20th century, we had 92% of all the patents issued on planet Earth. I mean, that should make the hair stand up on your head because anybody could look at a process and say, hey, I can improve that this way and that way, and then that open up in competition across the street and put the original uh, employer out of business. That kind of instability was anathema to, maybe to human nature. Certainly it was anathema to the managerial classes that arose out of the British and German uh, establishment. Who wants to know that some lackey named Andrew Carnegie winding thread on thread bobbins instead of going to school will, will in 12 years own you? <laughs> it just doesn't square with what, what literature teaches us about human nature. Maybe, maybe theology and sainthood teaches something different. I don't know. John, if you're a parent, you're terrified about what the institutional schools, you can't afford Groton, uh, you probably couldn't get in anyway, get your child in anyway, you don't want to send them to the public schools, you see that the local private schools uh, have their own problems and using the same curriculum and being under state supervision and so forth, what do you do? Well, th that's the right question, and, and I don't want to seem simplistic. The, 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 an excellent solution or a variety of them are right under our noses and they're being employed as you and I speak by hundreds of thousands of people. It's simply that journalism does not really investigate these things very closely. Uh, let, let, let me start with homeschooling because that would be the, that would be the most recognized alternative. Uh, we have the head of the Human Genome Project, Francis Collins, homeschooled on a remote sheep ranch in western Virginia, following probably the ultimate libertarian uh, logic uh, of, of training. And the logic
logic was this. He had three brothers, so there were four of them. His mother said, you may study anything you want for as long as you want, but I will hold you to this. All four brothers, different ages, have to agree to start or to stop. So Francis Collins, oh. following that particular prescription, got into Harvard, obviously no transcripts to submit, but many, many accomplishments, and rose like a meteor to the top of the scientific establishment. There is, I think, no scientific project on Earth that, that can possibly compare in prestige or influence to the Human Genome Project there. His partner on the Genome Project did go to a public high school in San Diego, California, and his autobiography just came out about a year ago. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, his name just vanished from my head, but it will come back. He was graduated with a D average from high school, but he didn't, in fact, earn a D average. He was such a rotten kid, cut school so often to go surfboarding, that the faculty passed him to get rid of him. Not an uncommon event. So what does he do after he graduates? He has no money. He goes into the Army to Vietnam as a buck private. This is the co-head of the Human Genome Project. I, I, I hope that your listeners see that we're now talking not about the arts, you know, writing a great novel or, or, or starting a, 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 an unstoppable business like McDonald's or Taco Bell or Burger King. We're talking about the hard sciences. And here we have the two premier <laughs> title holders in our lifetime, one a homeschooler who followed no curriculum at all and had no particular uh, leaning towards science or anything else. He was interested, as all of us should be, in everything. And the other, as rotten a human being and a student, <laughs> as you can imagine, being produced without being shot as a teenager. This is the Human Genome Project. Are there other examples? Sure. How about the, let's see, I believe he's the 22nd wealthiest man on earth and somebody who's been of great use. I know to many of your listeners, his name is Ingvar Kamprad, and he is the founder of IKEA. What we don't hear about Mr. Kamprad is that he was declared hopelessly dyslexic by his Scandinavian school authorities when he was in his early teen years. He dropped out. His mother was told that he had no future whatsoever. And he became a bicycle messenger selling fish. Now, I can't think of anything that might be more difficult to do than pedaling up to somebody and saying, would you like to buy a fish? But that's how Ingvar started out. And when he succeeded at that, he added wooden matches and Christmas tree ornaments to his bicycle basket. That's Ikea. I, 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 I really collect these. Uh, 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 the Wall Street Journal, uh, no, no, the uh, London, um, excuse me, just give me a minute, Financial Times of London, about five years ago, ran the story of how the largest steel mill in Germany, the Phoenix Mill, employing 10,000 people, was sold to the Chinese, to a company near Shanghai, because the Germans, all of them college educated, had figured out there was no future for steel. I may be wrong about the five years, maybe eight years ago, but the story's easy to look up in the 
in the journal to Google it. So they decided to dump the thing on China, who they, of course, were too dumb to realize there was no future in steel, and they were going to dump the cost of breaking the plant down, creating it, and sending it over and resetting it up. The Chinese bought the mill, but said, we'll move it ourselves. And one day, a freighter carrying a thousand Chinese peasants who had never disestablished the steel mill in their life without a single engineer aboard, but with a major peasant who had, under Mao, set up uh, one of these backyard steel mills and actually produced good steel when it's supposed to be in, impossible unless you have... Uh, state-of-the-art equipment there, they landed, and instead of the three years that uh, 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 the steel company in Germany had estimated it would take to do this, they broke the thing down in one year, created it, sent it to Shanghai, reestablished it, and built eight-lane highways to bring the customers to the mill. We have bought... I think a program, bit by bit, didn't happen all at once. It's a fantastic fantasy about what people are capable of, how they break down into these rigid groups where only a few can think on the policy level and then so on and so on. We've specialized to a degree that's unwholesome and fantastical there. So the Phoenix Steel Mill is a story I tell in uh, in Weapons of Mass Instruction. I try to collect others. David Sarnoff, who gave us uh, RCA and, uh, you know, NBC Network, Sarnoff dropped out of school because he said it was a waste of time when he was 12, I think, maybe 13, and became a newspaper boy. He had nothing but immigrant relatives who had no money and no contact. And bit by bit, just as Andrew Carnegie had done, by closely observing the world around him every couple of years, the little Sarnoff got farther and farther toward being, uh, you know, a citizen of significance. Uh, all of these stories, and Lou, you should appreciate this. When I grew up in the 1940s uh, in a coal mining town in western Pennsylvania, all of these stories were made available to us through school as inspirations. We learned that uh, Admiral Farragut had been put in charge of a warship at the age of 12 and done quite well against the British in the War of 1812. We learned that the oldest officer in the American Revolution was George Washington. He was the old man at 44, and almost all of the famous people we hear about and preserve like Alexander Hamilton, were teenagers up against the most technologically advanced military on the planet, and we wiped the floor with them. Uh, I think a renaissance, and I don't mean to over-romanticize here, because politically it's almost impossible to see how we do this, but individuals, you asked me about individual parents can store a few of these as a squirrel stores nuts to sustain them through the fear of their neighbors and maybe grandparents that this person will never be employable. What kind of an American attitude was that? Abraham Lincoln informed the Wisconsin Agricultural Association in 1859 but no American with his right mind thinks about getting a job. They think about how can I add value to the community? How can I do something better 
or cheaper than someone else is doing it there. And, and he told these farmers in Wisconsin, 1859, you'll find this story in, uh, I think, Carrington's Main Currents in American Thought, either that or Hofstadter's Anti-Intellectualism in America. Uh, he said 75% of our population has an independent livelihood. Small farmers, engineers, seamstresses, traveling entertainers, you name it. That was the road we were on before the Civil War. And then what happened was the British money that entered the country to finance the westward expansion brought the class-bound attitudes of England along with the money sent the sons to make sure the money was being spent correctly. And the Brits began to preach mudsill theory. You'll find this also in Lincoln's uh, talk. Mudsill theory. Why should you pay any attention at all to humble people who live in homes with mud door sills? They're a waste of time. They've been doomed biologically, socially, spiritually to being nobody. They were just human resources. And that's when Lincoln reacted with the, uh, this, this, this famous talk to the Wisconsin agriculturalists. And nor was he being romantic. There's no other way to explain what we did from independence right through the Civil War. There's no way to explain it other than that the gradations we make among people actually restrict the advance of prosperity. And from a libertarian point of view, I want to guarantee you that Adam Smith said the same thing. If you read very closely... The, the first 20 or 25 pages of uh, uh, Wealth of Nations, you'll find that Smith says the only difference between the son of a street sweeper and the son of a duke is that the street sweeper is starved of ideas and, and real work when, when, when he's young. But that if you were to remove that, what you would do is, is what he said you would do through, through competition. You would get this explosion of invention. And, of course, America was the workshop testing that principle, and it worked just fine, too fine, from, from a mass market corporate point of view, and too fine from the point of view of financial capitalism, but not from the point of view of the quality of everyday life and market capitalism. John Taylor Gatto, thank you so much for being on the show today. I think uh, those who have not heard the pleasure of hearing you before or reading you will now understand why I call you a poet as well as a great scholar. I want to urge everybody to read John's latest book, Weapons of Mass Instruction, his other two books, The Underground History of American Education and Dumbing Us Down. Take a look at his website, JohnTaylorGatto.com, a very exciting documentary project that, that he talks about on that website uh, that absolutely, as anybody who's heard this podcast will know, deserves great support from us. Uh, John, thank goodness for you, and, and thanks so much for coming on the show thank today. Thank you, Lou, and, and, and thank you for, for your work, which I think, uh, you, you know, and will, will be recorded in history as... as if we only had more Lou Rockwell. Thanks again. Bye now. Thank you, John. You've been listening to The Lou Rockwell Show, produced by LouRockwell.com, the best-read libertarian website in the world. We can go on Pretending day by day That someone Somewhere will soon make a change all a part of God's great big family and the truth you 
no love. 